what we have to say to that then is, if you take oral glutathione, oral glutathione is going to all go through the liver, guess what? It's not going to be available to brain, and it's not going to be available to the joints. It's not going to be available to the thyroid. So we always use a transdermal delivery in a form of a cream so that it's actually given to the bloodstream so it can go work at those peripheral tissues before it goes through this hungry, starving liver. So does the liver use it, or does it just like get killed? I mean, what does it do with it? It uses it. Because it. it needs it. Because it needs yeah. it to get the heavy sludge out, phase two. Okay? Great question, please. What stops our body from producing it? When we just reviewed again here, it's, when yeah, we have uh, food sensitivities, inflammation in the GI system impairs glutathione function. Okay, so the, again, the person who says I have um, irritable bowel symptoms or irritable bowel syndrome, the person who's, who has leaky gut syndrome, the person who says I have indigestion, the person who says I have refluxing heartburn, the person who says I have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, all of those conditions of the GI system are impairments of the glutathione pathways to absorb the nutrients essential for the liver to be able to optimize glutathione production and then making available to the other tissues. Okay? So these two are completely linked for glutathione production and utilization, meaning the GI system and the liver gallbladder system. Okay. Now, remember, when God created these amazing bodies, He created these very expendable organs, the appendix and the gallbladder, right? <laughs> just like the female reproductive system. We can just go ahead and lob those out, and while we're in there, why don't we take this out just in case, and this out just in case, right? That's the logic. I had a patient who came in. Her physician said to her, while we're doing your hysterectomy, we'll go ahead and take out your gallbladder and your appendix so it never bothers you. Well, that's a great idea. Sign me up. Sign it away. Came out with one, two, three little nice scars and no more worries, right? Okay. So when we look at this, this is a very important tonsil. Okay, this is a very important concentrator of bile salts, and this is very important for creation, right? So I don't think that there's anything that really was a mistake in its creation and its uh, versatility in being expendable. But at the same time then, why is it that the liver companion gallbladder so frequently ends up with these little gallstones? What is the cause most frequently of gallstones? Okay. So, what I have found most consistently is the inability to process excessive amounts of estrogen. Okay. Males very infrequently have gallbladder attacks. More frequently, who do you know that has had a gallbladder removed? Female, right? And with that, what usually comes first is the heavy menstrual bleeding. Okay? So the blood clots with menses, and then uncontrolled bleeding. So let's just go ahead and take that out. And by the way, before you get the gallbladder attack, let's take out your gallbladder. But you'll start to notice gallbladder symptoms so then the gallbladder is also removed, okay? And sometimes it's this before this, it just depends. Because oftentimes this will occur in the 30s and then this will occur in the 40s, right? What else is associated with that? Breast tenderness and irritability the week before my period. Well, that's PMS. So I have premenstrual syndrome with sensitivity to fatty foods and heavy bleeding with blood clots all associated then with estrogen dominance. What do we see it look like on blood labs? Our blood labs will show for the female my cholesterol greater than 200 and my LDL cholesterol greater than 100. 
Okay, so what's the answer to that? Lipitor, right? Does it make sense? That isn't our answer, but that's what the answer is. So now you've had this cut out, this cut out, you're going to be on Lipitor, and now you're going to be on a hormone patch because you feel like crud because you got hot flashes. Well, wait a minute, we already have excess of estrogen. Well, that's okay, we're going to give you estrogen and progesterone. And don't worry because it's bioidentical. Did we ever fix the liver and ever address the liver? Did we ever talk about the liver? Okay, so this isn't our approach. <clears throat> our approach is to work with the female who's saying I have these symptoms and figure out, first of all then, how can we better improve this phase one, phase two detoxification pathway and how can we better inactivate the excess of estrogen. The body is trying to be as efficient as possible. It doesn't just say, oh, it looks like today's going to be a tough day, I better make more estrogen. Seems a little cool in the house, so I better warm up and make a little more estrogen. Okay. The body's attempting to be as efficient as possible. And ideally, the liver should be just a warehouse of all of these little storage doors, if you will, storage units that just throw up the door and say, okay, estrogen, time to activate. Okay, inactivate and put it back in storage, in essence. Okay? And what happens is there are three forms of this estrogen. Two are very radical, and one is very efficient. When we look at that, one of those radicals has a tendency, though, to be more inefficient or less efficient when it's inactivated. And what we find lacking, then, is an enzyme in the, the liver that can inactivate that. So how can we upregulate that inactivating enzyme? We give something called indole-3-carbonyl, I3C, or something that's called DIM. Okay? And indole 3 carbonyl is an extract of broccoli and cruciferous vegetables, which helps to inactivate that excessive estrogen. So we'll start back at this pathway and help to clean that out. Okay? Kind of make sense? Nancy, you okay with that? Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah? Kind of new, kind of fast, huh? It is. There's welcome, a lot. Welcome to Tuesday night class. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these others, they've had a little bit more experience, so they don't have quite the smoke signals piling off their heads, right? And, and it will be repeated enough times that you'll get acquainted with it, all right? So that's what we look for, and that's what we want to use to help to inactivate that excess of estrogen, right? Now, what do most physicians also do in addition to giving Lipitor? Because estrogen is high, we need progesterone to balance it, so what do we bathe you in? Progesterone, right? So that's why we have these nice multi-level marketing companies that have progesterone creams and everything. And, oh, since I've been using this, I feel so good. You should try it. Oh, that is good. I'm going to tell everybody, right? And all of a sudden we've got an estrogen festival with a little progesterone baby. <laughs> Gives a whole new concept to baby showers, doesn't it? <laughs> so that's what we're looking for is healing. In our office, we're going to look, though, for how to increase the activation and inactivation pathways. We're going to look at how to optimize the progesterone-estrogen balance and then utilize this liver or optimize its function to help in these processes. Okay? If we can keep it clean through phase one and phase two detoxification pathways, it will become more efficient to make available not only neurotransmitters to eliminate my depression. Remember, 96% of neurotransmitters, including serotonin, acetylcholine, And we got dopamine and um, GABA. 96% of neurotransmitters are actually made in the GI system, not made in the brain. Remember we've talked about that before? So a healthy gut is a healthy brain. An unhealthy gut 
is an unhealthy brain. The more diseased or malfunctioning I feel that my GI system is, the more malfunctioning or diseased feels my brain. Okay? When a person has GI distress, how happy are they? They aren't. They're not happy. Okay? How happy is the female with a bunch of gallstones every time that time of the month comes when that hormone flux is way out of balance and that period that used to be three to five days is now seven to ten and this bleeding is so heavy for seven to ten days and then I get spotting throughout the month. How happy is she? She's not happy, right? I don't know, maybe you have some friends that are still happy though, but they just don't talk about it. <laughs> it's, don't call me, I'm in my room, you understand, right, girlfriend? So, that, and the husband doesn't understand, but he's trying. So as we look at this then, this GI health is really essential to brain health. What else does lack of liver GI function lead to? The thyroid, which is up here, if we had our model up here, we could actually draw the thyroid. The thyroid is that little butterfly organ that's right there in the base of the neck, okay? The thyroid produces T4, an inactive form of thyroid hormone. The liver activates 60% of that. 20% of that inactive thyroid hormone, though, is activated in the GI system with the healthy bacteria that's in the GI system. So if my liver isn't functioning correctly, I've had my gallbladder removed, and my GI system is in shambles, guess what happens to my body composition? I go soft. That's right. No matter how hard I work out, no matter how little I eat, my body composition continues to become softer and softer, or more impaired. Or in other words,